all the panelists and, and Ronald's uh, video. So, um, so as he's doing that, let me let me intro introduce the panel. Uh, so, uh, we have um, uh, we we have uh, on the panel uh, Andrew Childs, who who is um, from the University of Maryland. Uh, Andrew also co-directs the Joint Center uh, with um, with NIST uh, Fix. Uh, Andrew has done extensive work on quantum algorithms, on quantum walk algorithms, uh, you know, exponential speed up by quantum walk on, on quantum simulation. And, um, uh, and he was actually, you know, he, he got his PhD from MIT, uh, actually with, uh, with Eddie Fari as, uh, as advisor. So uh, um, that brings me to the next person on the panel, who is Eddie Fari. Uh, besides being Andrew's advisor, he, uh, you know, he, he, he has a lot of, uh, you know, he's he was uh, uh, he pioneered these, uh, you know, walk continuous walk based algorithms, um, uh, quantum adiabatic optimization, as well as QAOA. Um, you know, he's. Um, He's currently a principal scientist at Google for uh, working on quantum computing, but uh, he used to be uh, on the faculty at MIT and the director of the, um, of the Center for Theoretical Physics there. And um, we also have Ashley Montanaro uh, uh, from the University of Bristol uh, in the School of Mathematics. Uh, he's um, you know, obviously worked on uh, extensively on quantum algorithms for over 15 years and he's, uh, uh, in, including the finite element methods that uh, that uh, Ronald mentioned, but he's also the co-founder of uh, of Facecraft, which is a quantum software startup. Um, incidentally, that's a that's a great name for uh, for a quantum uh, uh, company. So um, uh, so I, let's let's move on to the to the panel. It would be uh, you know we'll start with um, with short uh, maybe two to three minute. Uh, 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 comments by each of the panelists, uh, both on any aspect of Ronald's talk you'd like to talk about, but but let's also um, you know broaden broaden the discussion also to to heuristic uh, optimization, you know, including QAOA and variational methods and so on. Um, uh, and in, you know, uh, it would be it would be good to hear about anything you have to say about those methods, including. You know, evidence for speed ups or, or reasons that you might, you know, uh, uh, work on that. But also, um, it, I think it would be it would be interesting also to hear about, um, you know, your opinions about, uh, um, you know, a what are the most promising quantum algorithms in at whichever level you want to think about them in the in the in the near term, in the medium term, or in the long term, you know what what you would think of as the most promising approaches, as well as um, you know if you were advising a young researcher to work on quantum algorithms, what directions would you would you suggest to them? So, you know anything that you would you know. In other words, I'd like you to talk about anything you'd like to about this subject. So, uh, uh, with with. Uh, uh, Anyone want to start, or shall I? You know, should we go alphabetically? Um, Maybe I can just start if it's okay, because I actually need to head out and be fifteen yes. minutes, which I apologize for. But, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, if I could just uh, uh, just take a couple of minutes. I mean, maybe I would start just with a minor quibble with something that Ronald said, you know, in the talk, which is that um, you know he sort of identified simulation as maybe one of the three main applications of quantum computers, you know, along with crypto and and simulation and um, uh, I think that maybe there's a difference you know with these these three things I guess for sort of crypto analysis and for simulation we have I think you know really compelling evidence that that are exponential speed ups whereas for optimization at least you know from, from what we heard in the talk uh, you know I think there's lots of really interesting uh, polynomial speed ups but you know I guess Ronald also talked a little bit about why maybe we um, you know may have to wait a long time before we before those turn into something practical so um, I think you know I guess the evidence for like exponential speed ups 
uh, for for optimization is um, you know much less clear, I think. And um, so I, I you know I agree that I would I would sort of highlight this as a potential application of quantum computers and a very interesting one, but maybe not quite at the same sort of with the same status as sort of crypto and um, uh, simulation. I mean, I, uh, say, I completely agree with that. It's clearly the weakest of the three things that I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, Good to hear. I mean, I, I I would also say that I you know I feel like um, you know there's lots of really sort of from a theoretical perspective, lots of really interesting things to say about uh, polynomial speedups. I mean, we heard many such things in this in this you know really beautiful talk, and I think that this is a really interesting area. I mean, one sort of question that Ronald mentioned that I think is you know that I've been particularly interested in is this question of you know the the sort of speed up we we can hope to get for general convex optimization from from quantum computers. I think there's some really nice you know still open questions there where there's you know even some potential maybe for um, super quadratic but still only polynomial speed up. So I think that that's you know potentially interesting even if not you know likely to be super practical in the in the very near term. Um, I think it would be great to you know sort of think about the possibility of actually getting sort of provable exponential advantage for some kind of optimization problems. I mean I don't think that that's somehow completely ruled out. We just don't know exactly where to go. Um, you know, there's there was this nice recent result about sort of exponential speedups for graph problems with cut queries that you know happened maybe a year ago. Um, so I mean, I think you know there's still the possibility for identifying new sort of interesting exponential quantum speedups. Um, and I would also really like to hear from Eddie, sort of like um, uh, sort of you know where things stand with respect to sort of you know adiabatic optimization, QAOA. I mean, I, I do think that there's a lot of you know potential there. I think the situation is to me very unclear, but uh, it seems like that's something a lot of people want to hear about. So um, yeah, I would like to hear more about what he has to say about that. Okay, so I guess it's my turn. Yeah, so one thing is, is that, um, Ronald, you characterized the QAOA as, as a, a variational algorithm and as a heuristic. And I would like to say something about that. Well, first of all, the QAOA at the lowest depth, you can find the optimal parameters in advance and by classical methods. So it's not variational. And second of all, it, at the shallowest depths, you have worst case performance guarantees. And I think that, you know, you should not overlook the fact that we can guarantee, for example, a max cut on three regular graphs an approximation ratio of 0.69 something. Now, you're going to say that that's not as good as the best classical, and I would have to agree with that. But I think you should not downplay the fact that in this space, we have techniques, which we never had before, to get worst case performance guarantees on optimization. And, and, and for the QAOA, as the depth increases, it can only improve, and you can find the parameters in advance. So I would not call that a variational heuristic. I would call it an algorithm with specified parameters with guaranteed worst case performance guarantees. And I keep saying that because I think that makes it, um, people should use these things. And, and, and well, first let me say one other thing, and then I'll say what I think people should do. Another thing we did recently is we showed how to analyze the QAOA at any depth in the, up for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model in the infinite size limit. Okay, so we took, we took random instances of the SK model, which is an all to all model. You have, it's, it, I'll just define it for those who don't know. It's a, you're on a complete graph with plus or minus one couplings on every edge. And we were able to show is that for typical instances that um, we could analyze the performance of the QAOA, this is at fixed P after we took N to infinity. So it's as shallow as you could imagine because we've already taken it to be infinitely big. And we were able to get an iteration that allows us to measure the performance of the algorithm. And you know, we passed this SDP um, value uh, and again, and, and, we, get, and we, we can find the parameters and they concentrate, which means you have the same parameters for every instance. So I would not call that a variational algorithm because if you find the parameters for one instance, they work for all instances. And, um, and could, we proved all these concentration results. So I think that there, um, Again, it's not variational and it has worst case performance guarantees. Now I know that we haven't been able to beat Montanari's algorithm uh, for this problem. Where there, in the last two years, there was a huge breakthrough in this field 
when Andrea Montanari was able to get um, an algorithm which comes within one minus epsilon of the best value in time that goes like one over epsilon squared. Now we haven't done that yet. Okay, but that's only two years old. And so I, you know, I, I think there's huge room for people to play here. Like, you know, why can't people try to take the techniques we used for the SK model where we do typical instances, provable results, and analyze other problems, random instances of anything, graphs, max cut on, you know, any kind of graph you like, or take the approximation, try to go to higher depth. And I am not impressed with the fact that, you know, there are, that Hastings wrote a paper showing that if P equals one, he had an algorithm that beat the QAOA. I mean, so what? I really couldn't understand that. It was beyond me why people thought that was interesting. And I'm just being blunt about it. And especially since at P equals one, the QAOA also has supremacy. So it's a, it's a quantum algorithm. If it did, I mean, it has supremacy. You can prove that you can't sample from the output distribution according to the standards of, uh, you know, whatever. It's a very, you know, it's a very rigorous. It's like, um, what are those things? IP something circuits. It's the same thing. But, you know, so it's obviously a quantum algorithm. Otherwise, it wouldn't have supremacy. And so, and, and okay, I'm going to keep going since you pushed me, you know, so, you know, the other thing we did last year is we showed that the QAOA will fail if you don't see the whole graph in something like max, um, maximum independence set on a Rennie graph. And we rigorously proved, this is me, David Gamarnik and Sam Gutman, we use some of the same techniques that Kamarnik and Sudan use to show limitations of classical algorithms, local algorithms. And we use the locality of the QAOA for on maximum independent set uh, on, on a deregular graphs. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't, they're not all to all connected to show limitations of the QAOA. But those limitations are only for P less than a constant times log N. And once your P is bigger than log N, you see the whole graph, if it's a random graph, and then there's no indication, no indication that the algorithm will fail, none. And so what can I say? I mean, and also if you put the numbers in for, the, for what we found on maximum independent set, if you're at a million qubits and, we, and, and you're three regular, which is the least spreading possible, you, you only could show a limitation for P less than seven. And Bravi's result is weaker. He shows, you know, he at two million qubits, he can only show the QAOA fails at like P less than two. So mm. I don't know, it seems to me that it seems like a very fertile area for exploration. Um, you know, can we analyze the QAOA at higher depth? Can we get provable results? Can we look at typical instances? Can we prove limitations? I think it's, think it's anyway that's my opinion <laughs> okay thanks thanks eddie thanks for the so uh ashley maybe do you want to yeah sure okay i'll, I'll go next um so first uh, i should apologize that i wasn't able to be here for most of ronald's talk so hopefully what i say is not totally disconnected from from the discussion um, oh yeah well, I, think... I forgot to say you had you gave a great talk ronald i'm so sorry actually to interrupt you that's no problem I'm uh, sorry. The, the five minutes I thought were indeed indeed great. So, um, yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. And um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll maybe just focus on on part of your question, Umes, which is the the question of what seem to be interesting directions uh, for, for for the future. Yeah, um, and I guess I mean, Ronald mentioned, and we've discussed this sort of interesting dichotomy that we've got at the moment in in the. Uh, world of optimization problems where we have these beautiful um, quantum algorithms where we have rigorous performance bounds but often the it's quantum speed up is perhaps not as big as we would like it's kind of quadratic or something whereas we've got these um, more heuristic kind of algorithms uh, which may have an exponential speed up and maybe you're suitable in the near term but we can't prove it and I think for, for me there are really interesting directions in both of these sort of lines and when we think about the, the rigorous um, algorithms I think one thing that was maybe clear from from Ronald's talk is how many really interesting new ideas we get when we think about this uh, this line of, of work. So, uh, I mean, for example, the quantum algorithm for escaping from saddle points, which Ronald mentioned, I think um, this this is a sort of really nice uh, new technique involving 
um, looking at a sort of quantum simulation of the Schrodinger equation to somehow solve optimization problems more efficiently than we expect to be able to do classically, which I think many people like me would not have expected would be possible. So I think this um, th this can really give us new ideas, which may end up being useful for larger speedups. And I also think that these rigorous algorithms are really important for fundamental reasons. I mean, if we think that quantum computing um, is a sort of deeper theory than classical computing, because quantum mechanics is a deeper theory than classical mechanics, then pinning down the precise complexity of some fundamental computational problems should be even more important than in the classical case. And if we're willing to spend decades understanding the complexity of matrix multiplication classically, we should also be willing to pin down the complexity of some of these problems quantumly. But I guess the, the uh, flip side of that is that these problems should really be fundamental ones because um, these algorithms, you know, that achieve a quantum speed up of a power of 0 0.01 are probably not going to be practically relevant. So we should really care about the problem for some sort of deep reason. Um, and on the, the sort of uh, the, the heuristic side, I guess, I, I would say that one class of algorithms that was mentioned but hasn't been discussed, I guess, so, so much today, um, is these algorithms for solving problems to do with quantum mechanics. So, for example, um, simulating quantum physics systems, quantum chemistry systems, this, this kind of thing, mm. like the VQE algorithm. Um, and I think like it's, it's clear that, I guess, the community thinks that this is an exciting direction. If you look at the deluge of papers on the archive where people are doing uh, firstly experiments, but also coming up with new algorithms and new ideas in, in this direction. And I think there are several reasons for that. I mean, one of them is that there are many exciting practical applications. Um, and, uh, and another, I guess, is the fact that there are some nice contributions you can make. It's a sort of very wide open area. And um, as you know, I'm finding now having a, a quantum startup that there are many sort of interesting problems that are of this more sort of applied flavor to do with um, simulating quantum systems where you can apply sort of algorithmic thinking and get some sort of quite interesting speed ups and um, can can make some perhaps really practical difference to the performance of these algorithms. Um, and I guess I guess the last thing maybe I'd like to, to mention is about these heuristic algorithms for optimization that, that Eddie discussed a lot. Um, I mean, I think, I, I guess I would agree with, with Eddie in the sense that although perhaps some of these algorithms do not have, you know, at yet, as yet dramatic performance improvements over the best class of algorithms we have. Um, somehow, we don't really know like what the potential is of this, this direction yet, I would say. And I think this is particularly important when we think that in a few years time, we may have quantum computers that have thousands of qubits, um, but perhaps not great fidelities yet. And so these algorithms that might be very low depth and sort of heuristic and sample from some interesting solution space could become very important. And I think um, yeah, I, I guess another interesting question in this, this area is, can these algorithms find solutions which are not necessarily better in terms of having a lower energy or sort of satisfying a large number of constraints, but they're somehow different in the sense that the set that this quantum algorithm is sampling from is somehow a set which would be very challenging for the classical algorithm to sample from. And we think, as Eddie mentioned, that this should be the case that we could do this sometimes because of these quantum supremacy type arguments. And could it be the case that, that the solutions we get have some interesting features which we don't see classically? And I think mm. this is a really interesting question to explore. I think okay. that's, that's everything Thanks. I can say. Yes. Thank, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, so uh, maybe we can, that's really help. interesting. So can we turn to Ronald? Uh, do you, would you like to, your, for your reactions? Uh, to uh, I guess I mostly want to respond to Eddie. Um, so first, let me say, I think QAOA is a very interesting idea. I basically sort of, Put it aside at the start of my talk, not because I think it's a stupid thing, but but because it's different from the things that I wanted to talk about, right? And and my my calling it a heuristic, uh, I call it a heuristic in the following sense: uh, the cases where we can analyze it, it's no better than than classical algorithms. The cases where we have hope for a speed up, we can't prove anything. It's a heuristic in that sense, right? Something no. is is a heuristic at a certain point in time. Like at some point, you later point, maybe you can actually analyze it, and it converts from a heuristic to a to actual analytical result. I don't. I can't follow what you're saying. I just can't parse it. I mean, it's I, I can analyze it. It just doesn't do as well as the classical, but it's still analyzable. I mean, yeah, this is exactly exactly what I mean. Right? Well, I thought a heuristic is something you can't analyze. A heuristic well, is just a process which you don't have the power to analyze. That's what I thought. Maybe I'm mistaken. I mean, a heuristic isn't an algorithm that doesn't do as well as a classical algorithm. A heuristic is an algorithm you can't analyze, right? That's what I thought you meant. 
No, no, what I meant is I make a distinction between the cases where we can analyze QAOA and other variational algorithms. In those cases, those things are not heuristics, but they, unfortunately, they also don't, don't perform better than classical algorithms. Yeah, and that's on, on the other hand, there are the regimes where we cannot prove anything, where we do have some hope for good performance, and there I would call them heuristic. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and, and it's certainly worthwhile sort of trying out these things, right? Uh, one of the, the great features of QAOA is, is you don't need to worry about QRAM. Yep. Right? So if, if you really hate QRAM, that sort of sinks 80% of my talk and it doesn't sink QAOA. But, but I, on the other hand, uh, let me just, I think QAOA is getting a surprising amount of attention given how little indication we have that it actually outperforms classical algorithms. Well, I would say, it's more, there's a simple reason for that, and it's very low depth. I mean, you get provable performance guarantees at the lowest depth. And like actually said, we're going to have quantum computers at low depth, and what else are you going to run on them? You know, and so it's the obvious thing to run on a low depth machine is a, a low depth algorithm. I, think I agree with you, but low depth is not set in stone, right? Hopefully in a few years time, this low depth will get bigger and bigger depth. And at some point we'll transition to, uh, to hopefully to the kinds of algorithms that I discussed. Sure. But I mean, if you have a quantum computer now, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you've got to run something. And so it's actually, yeah. Yeah. So, so coming, coming back to a question I'd, uh, I'd asked earlier, you know, so if you were to, if you were to, look out further into the horizon, medium or even very long term, what, what would the algorithm be that, you know, what, what algorithms would you actually be saying are the most, most promising or the most interesting? You know, anybody have a... I mean, I think quantum simulation is probably the most, the most interesting thing more in the sort of like medium term, or, I mean, I don't know what's, what counts as short term and what counts as medium yeah. term, but I think you know, I think we, it's, it's, I think it's also kind of unclear just how useful quantum simulators will be in a, you know, NISC kind of regime in the, in the sort of, you know, where we are now or what we can expect to have in, in five years. But I think, you know, I think if you look at the sort of um, overheads of kind of, you know, even sort of quantum simulation algorithms as compared with like factoring, you know, probably you can, you can expect to solve um, interesting instances of quantum simulation problems sooner than you, than you could factor, uh, you know, thousand bit numbers. And also, by the way, why do you want to factor thousand bit numbers? Because, you know, it's pretty, pretty limited utility. So, uh, and I think that that's going to be useful, like far, far beyond the, you know, I guess you and Ronald discussed this, uh, you know, uh, when you have quadratic, quadratic speed ups and the constant factor is 10 to the 10, you know, it's going to be a really long time before a quadratic speed up is going to be a useful thing. So I and, think- And so if you, if you were to pick a, pick a winning uh, quantum algorithm for some simulation in that in that regime you know uh, in whatever regime into the future what what would your what would your uh, I mean I think probably be? just you know I think it's got to be as simple as possible to be the thing that we're going to do in the nearest term and so I think you know maybe sort of like computational you know condensed matter physics is maybe a good candidate because you can look at very simple spin models where you can you can see for example these kind of like you know, thermalization transitions or something like that. You can ask questions about them that, you know, it's maybe not not obvious how to analyze these systems. They're, mm -hmm. they're you know, probably beyond the reach of classical simulation. And there's probably interesting things you can, you can say about them. Now, this is maybe not as exciting as, you know, designing a drug that's going to be, um, you know, is, is save lots of lives. But I mean, you, you know, doing, doing some kind of computational, uh, you know, uh, theoretical physics would be, I think, you know, a very interesting thing that would be beyond sort of just demonstrating, you know, the sort of power and principle of quantum computers. I guess if, maybe if I can uh, follow up on that, and I guess for, for me, I, I completely agree with Andrew about applications in quantum simulation of various kinds, where simulation doesn't necessarily mean just time dynamics. Maybe it means sort of, for me, something like VQE, like understanding sort of low energy states of a quantum system or something. And I, I guess I would say in this sort of medium term sort of era, um, so something slightly between these two points that Andrew mentioned, I think, seems very exciting to me. These two points of um, condensed matter physics, sort of do it, basically doing a physics experiment but on a quantum computer and then designing a new drug. You've got um, in that whole region in the middle, you've got things like material science, maybe understanding some physical system, which still sort of seems to sit more naturally within quantum physics rather than chemistry, but somehow is maybe uh, and is maybe more well suited for study on a quantum computer. So maybe designing new batteries, new solar cells, things like this. Um, I think for, for me, these are all things that are interesting in this, this medium term regime. 
And of course, to some extent, you should also be able to combine quantum chemistry simulations with optimization, where you have some sort of toolbox that simulates the behavior of a certain molecule, and then you, you try to optimize over different possible molecules to find one that, that behaves uh, the best. Mm -hmm. um, there, yeah. I guess the question is if you want to put your whole optimization algorithm in the quantum computer though, right, somehow, because then maybe actually squeezing this, this big molecule in becomes more, more challenging, but, but yeah, no, that's quite right. Yeah. Um, so An Andrew unfortunately had to leave. He had, he had told me in advance he had to leave uh, closer to twelve thirty. So he, he he stayed as long as he could. Um, yeah, I, I I guess um, I didn't get a chance to ask him, but um, you know what I had meant to ask him, you know, was was not just what the application would be, but which particular algorithm would he think you know, because there are several algorithms for, for simulation. And so my, my, my question was more, you know, not just which application would you, would you think is the most interesting one, but which particular algorithms would you think are going to be the most relevant or the most interesting ones, say, as you look out into the future? Well, maybe I'll just, uh, just continue on what I was just saying in, in the sense that I think for me, um, I, I, I think VQE really will be quite important. And I think one reason for this is that I think um, uh, rather than just thinking about this in terms of like an optimization task, let's say, of finding like the ground state of some quantum system, which even in the, you know, the worst case, we have good theoretical reasons to think we shouldn't be able to do this. I guess I, I would think of this as sort of as really as an ansatz. So it's a, a a family of quantum states which can be produced by quantum computers but which we think probably can't be produced by classical computers and these may have some interesting properties they may be a lot closer to the, the sort of true ground state of the physical system or they may enable us to to really understand and study the physical properties of these systems in ways that we can't do with our classical methods um so so i think this this is something where once we're able to produce these things and run these algorithms on the quantum computer, we really are going to learn lots of interesting things about quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And so, so given given that um, that view, um, um, would you say that we have to wait until we can do uh, actual simulations, and or we have quantum computers till we get get uh, to understand VQE, or or do you see a path towards theoretically understanding VQE or conceptually understanding it? while we are waiting for large enough quantum computers. Right, well, well, it's in interesting that you have this, this divide between you know, running on a quantum computer and theoretically and conceptually understanding it. Because I guess I would say there's a third way, which is the, the classical numerical simulations, right? Which you can do on relatively large mm -hmm. numbers of qubits, like mm -hmm. perhaps you know, 30 qubits or something if you want to on PQ or maybe, maybe a little less. And I think this can give you a lot of insight into scaling and I think basically you need to be able to run on a large enough size that you can plot some points on a graph and see if the scaling is looking bad or, or, or not bad. Um, but I think the, the question of finding deeper theoretical understanding is also very important, but it's just, you know, it, it's just really challenging. And I think this is why perhaps algorithms like QEOA are a sort of nice playground because maybe they're a bit easier to, to analyze than, uh, the, than let's say VQE for the Fermi Hubbard model or something, but while still, mm -hmm really being pretty challenging, as I think it's clear, looking at a lot of the, the theoretical papers in this, this area. So you, you can maybe get a bit more of a handle on the complexity. I think there's also a bit of a poor fit between these chemistry problems and the usual tools of theoretical computer science in the sense that uh, in, in chemistry, you care about particular finite size objects, let's say the Fimoco. Uh, you don't care about uh, sort of asymptotic analysis where n runs to infinity. So I think we as theoretical computer scientists, if we want to sort of help elucidate theoretically these problems, we will really have to change our mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. And and would you would you say that letting epsilon tend to zero would not be sufficient to use? Uh, well, because people in chemistry are interested in a particular finite uh, epsilon, what they yeah. call what is it called, chemical accuracy or something like that, um, right? And then of course you could let your epsilon get much much smaller, but people would just shrug. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the point about accuracy, I mean, I think that is an interesting one. I think, I think this is a real challenge to understand theoretically, like the, the way, the, the speed with which the accuracy of um, the VQE solution, say, it converges to the, you know, the, the, tr the true solution as, as the size of the quantum circuit increases. And in fact, I mean, 
one thing I, I was surprised about when we did numerical experiments with VQE is how quick this convergence was. And often the error goes down exponentially with the number of layers of your VQE circuit, for example, which for me was pretty surprising. I was much more pessimistic to start with, mm -hmm. but it would but be very nice to have a, a good theoretical understanding of this. And I, I don't really do yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I guess I, maybe just one other thing I'd say is that m maybe the tools of theoretical computer science are not, you know, so directly suited to understanding, let's say, the accuracy of solving a FOMOCO or something. But I think one way in which these tools are very relevant is understanding the scaling of algorithms with the system size, right? So if you have a system that has, you know, n atoms in it or something like this or n electrons, then it's very nice to be able to understand how the complexity of your quantum circuit scales with n. And I think this is something which people have been able to do in many cases, like, like designing algorithms using fermionic swap networks and things like this, where, where in the end you can come up with rigorous bounds, which may not be tight for particular physical systems of interest, but at least they enable you to say, okay, this is poly time and you know, we have some sort of evidence that the algorithm is pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. Right, the n could be the number of orbitals, for instance. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah, I see. Uh, I see some questions. So there is a raised hand by Nixon Patel. Uh, let me allow Nixon to talk. Uh, Nixon, please ask your question if you if you can see it. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure if Nixon is hearing it, but Adam has a question. Uh, oh, Adam, yeah. Hi, uh, great talk, Reynolds. What do you think about the prospects for a, an exponential speed up with these SDP algorithms? I mean, um, probably there's some way of encoding Shor's algorithm into it somehow if you squint the right way, but I mean, you know, a more... Uh, reasonable exponential speed up there. Yeah, so you can get exponential speed ups if you assume a very strong model where, for instance, there's some, some efficient way to prepare these Gibbs states in, in, in a time that's, let's say, uh, polynomial in the number of qubits rather than the dimension. So I think with sufficiently strong assumptions, it is possible to get exponential speed ups there. Um, but have all the pieces been put together? Like, you know, we know that there are some physical systems where you can prepare Gibbs states efficiently, but you know, has, it seems like there's still more details to work out, right? Yeah, I, th I think Fernando Brandao has thought about this. I have not, so uh, okay. um, I haven't even started working out those details uh, because I'm not, yeah. I can't really find anyway, that, that... a reasonable sort of physical situation where, um, where, where all the pieces fit and, and there's no polynomial dependence on N and M left. But that's where you would look though. I mean, it would, it, would actually, it would actually be great to find any kind of sort of semi-reasonable exponential speed up for an optimization problem. And, and this, this is definitely one of, the, one of the sort of avenues that could lead to one. So, sorry, Aram, you, you started by saying, well, you could, you could, um, you could um, encode uh, Shor's factoring algorithm in, in, in an STP. Is that, um, is that uh, sort of- I don't of, know for sure that you could, hand, but maybe, I... yeah. I wouldn't be surprised is what I'm saying is, mm -hmm. you know. It's not, wouldn't be surprising because uh, like uh, HHL is BQP complete. Um, you, right. you can somehow encode linear systems in a linear program. Uh, mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. like that could lead to a BQP hardness result for SDP solving in some sense. Right. It's not known, but right. That's, it, it, would, it wouldn't be surprising, but ultimately that's not really what we're looking for. Great. Any so, other uh, questions? There's a question in Q&A. Uh, uh, can you comment on the utility prospects of genetic algorithms for optimization on quantum computers? Uh, I'm not sure if that's addressed to me, but let me say something about it. So genetic algorithms are, um, are, are very much heuristic, um, which means that um, I mean, this, this is also something where um, I, I don't think much is known in terms of provable speed ups. Uh, there's also the issue that genetic algorithms, they tend to work in, in iterations, like each, each iteration is another step of sort of recombining DNA or whatever it is that you're recombining. 
Um, I'm not aware of any kind of quantum speed up for optimization problems where you significantly reduce the number of iterations. Um, so from the provable perspective, I, I don't know any good speed up for genetic algorithms. Okay, thanks. Uh, David, uh, here's a question. Uh, there's a question. Hi, so, sorry, this is a bit off topic to the to the things you're discussing so far, but I was very curious. Uh, the question is directed to Ashley, since you mentioned that he's part of a startup, and I was wondering, especially given everything that people said about how far away and from practical applications these some of these things are going to be, who would fund a startup in quantum computing? With what kind of motivation and with what uh, timeline in mind or the time horizon in mind? Right. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think, um, I mean, okay, so, so the first question about who, who would fund you know, such startups, I mean, are, if, if you look around the different quantum startups that have been funded, I mean, often the answer is uh, venture capitalists, about venture capital firms or, or large, let's say, institutional investors, um, people with sort of fairly, fairly deep pockets in, in some cases, um, sometimes governments. Um, and, and I guess one question about one answer about the timeline is different people do have different levels of optimism about this. And there will be some who say that we're not going to see any interesting applications in quantum computing for 20 years, but others who say, well, you know, we're two to three years, then we're going to see some exciting applications. So, um, so investors will also, you know, make their mind up and have different levels of, uh, of um, optimism about the timeline. And I guess I would say as well that quite a lot, well, perhaps a surprising number of, um, of venture investors um, do take a fairly long-term view. I mean, they have funds which may have a sort of eight to 10 year lifetime or something like this. And that they are prepared to, to wait for some time to, um, you know, to get their money back to make a profit. And I think they, they do in general accept that quantum computing is a, a sort of long-term bet and that they're, they're prepared to take this, uh, this sort of approach. And of course it's, it's worth saying as well, there are, um, going beyond startups, I mean, there are major companies such as you know, Google, IBM, Microsoft that are also investing heavily in this area, including on the theory side and algorithms and, and software development. Um, and they can also afford to take a very long term view because uh, they've got the, the cash to back that up. Any other questions? Well, I see Gavin Moore. So, uh, so there's one uh, by Eric uh, on QA. Uh, in short, uh, does machine learning as a whole seem like a reasonable application of QAOA? I wonder if Eddie would like to answer that. Um, machine learning as a whole? Um, well, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, it depends on what you mean by QAOA. In a way, QAOA, if you just view it as um, an alternation of um, simple unitaries, which depend on parameters, if you have a very general view of that, um, you know, you have, and suppose, you, you know, the unit, one thing about the QAOA is maybe the unitary should be chosen according to the hardware. In other words, instead of just saying the unitaries are the exponential, the cost function and the rotations that we originally proposed, you might just say, let the unitaries be those that are naturally given to you by your hardware so that you, you parameterize your hardware by whatever naturally way, natural way you do it, and then you run those unitaries and try to find a solution. So if you generalize the QAOA to be something like that, which is beyond what we originally proposed, certainly, then I'm sure machine learning could be put in a context like that. You have, you know, but it would be presumably with classical data. I mean, you could worry about doing it with quantum data, but then you probably have the problem of levels that of quantum RAM. But, um, I don't know. I mean, in, in machine learning, you optimize parameters to get a, a result. Um, and I, I, yeah, I mean, you can, like, if you want to call that QAOA, I don't think it is, but it's uh, there's an idea that's similar there. Great. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, you know, we are, uh, maybe this is a good time to to uh, move to gather town. I, I posted the link on chat. So anybody would like to continue the discussion on gather town, please. Um, well, let's go there. Um, so, um, okay. So, you know, with that, let me, let me thank uh, Ronald for a fantastic talk and to the panelists, uh, Andrew and Eddie and Ashley for a really great discussion. 
Actually, since this is the last uh, colloquium for this semester, I, I should also thank all the all the speakers for this series and all the panelists. It's been it's been really fun, and you know, it's been uh, um, yeah, it's been really informative and very fun. And uh, we'll try to continue again in the fall. And um, uh, if anybody has suggestions about uh, what they'd like to hear about, please let us know. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we're supposed to click on the Gather Town link and then we go there. Just help us yes. out. Yes, yes. If you click on the Gather Town uh, link, um, then you can join us then. Should we try it before you log us out? I mean, uh, yes. And um, in fact, uh, um, don't shut the chat. You know, many of you already have the Gather Town link. Uh, it it should have been emailed, but uh, but. Um, in, in I, I won't shut it, 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 it doesn't really work very well on Safari, so uh, I always run Gather Town on, uh, on some other browser because on Safari it's a disaster. Right. Uh, Chrome is particularly, it, it seems to work well on. So, Thanks, by the way, Umesh, for organizing this whole series. Uh, I've attended every one of the talks and they were always very good. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank, and thank all the speakers, uh, and including yourself. Thanks very much.